Welcome to the Libertarian Counterpoint. I'm Richard Fields. On the program today we have uh, Edwin Edabiri, who is the uh, uh, founder of uh, the I Am Happy Project and the uh, Neighborhood Happiness Project, John Cameron, who is uh, the Liberty Society Manager at Pacific Legal Foundation, and Jason McPhee, an engineer for the state of California. Welcome, gentlemen. We're on uh, at uh, www.accesssacramento.org. Uh, if you want to watch us, uh, Channel 17 is the tab to push there on the internet. We're on Channel 17, of course, in Sacramento, and we're on uh, various cable channels all over the place as well, uh, in other cities, as well as uh, YouTube and Facebook. So welcome to the show. Thank you very much for being part of the, uh, of the program. Uh, the person who won the uh, legislative or the uh, congressional seat in uh, I think it's the Bronx, part of uh, lower, lower Brooklyn, somewhere around there. Anyway, uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez has made a whole lot of uh, news by, well, first of all, beating an old white guy in a largely minority uh, uh, district in the in the uh, in the in the city. That's not quite so surprising because she was a young, energetic, photogenic uh, campaigner that was able to. Uh, to you know, to to forge an emotional bond, uh, uh, connection with the, with the voters in that district, but what's really interesting to me is that she has turned out to be the most, and I use the words in quotation marks, the most progressive uh, politician that we can possibly imagine now that she is in Washington D.C. and she is uh, using the spotlight for everything that it's worth. She has told us that. Uh, the world is going to end in 12 years if we don't ad address climate change. And she has a way of doing it, which she calls the Green New Deal. Jason, what uh, is green about the Green New Deal, and how much will it cost? Well, um, it's, uh, the main focus is supposed to be looking at uh, climate change, but it seems like it's much more about a, a New Deal than it is about being a Green New Deal. And so they, they talk about uh, rolling in universal health care, guarantees on jobs. They talk about uh, universal basic income is one of the things that's been floated in it. A job for so, anybody who can't work or doesn't want to. Yeah, that was, that was I, I think that was not actually in the final draft, but it was in a draft that made its way to the press. Yes. <laughs> so, so They wisely took it out. Yes, and, and I mean, you know, the UBI has been floated by a lot of, uh, you know, big tech gurus recently, but... Um, it's uh, certainly these are all things though that certainly aren't directly related to climate change they're much more about a uh, socialist new deal type of policy so um, that that's I think the part that concerned me I think uh, most of the time when we have a, a problem that we want to reach to government to deal we want government to be uh, simple and transparent as possible as it uh, tries to approach those uh, solutions and this to me seems like you're you're pretty much throwing everything in the, the cart can possibly hold. <laughs> what, what, what's interesting is a, a think tank, uh, you know, Senator Left, I think it was think tank, I forget the name of it, uh, did a, a cost analysis of what the Green New Deal would actually cost. Part of it is uh, fixing the power grid or updating the power grid, moving from, from uh, uh, coal and uh, petrochemical uh, power generation to uh, uh, well, nukes, solar, Yay. and wind, and and you know, try to get nukes past the environmental movement. I, good luck with that. But in any case, it is the most cost-effective way to get rid of uh, carbon dioxide. Anyway, they they put a you know pencil to it and figured out that that's going to cost about 5.4 trillion over the next, I think, 10 years, something like that. That's a 22 percent increase in uh, everybody's electric bill on average. They came up with uh, how much it would cost to move. They're talking about moving from air transportation to high-speed rail transportation. We know how well that's working with a bullet train in, in California, but they want to do that nationwide. I'm not sure how that works with Hawaii. I'm sure that they'll figure it out. Uh, in any case, it's a $2.7 trillion uh, price tag for that, figured conservatively. They want to have the jobs guarantee. Anybody that doesn't have a job gets a job. Uh, that's going to cost about $45 trillion. Of course, rolling in universal health care, Medicare for all, whatever you want to call it, would add another $32 trillion. And they've thrown in food security for those of us who are still hungry, uh, another $1.5 trillion. Ten-year cost, you can figure, you can call it $90 trillion, but that's really a meaningless figure. It comes out to $275,000 and change per person for every man, woman, and child. That's what this would actually cost. 
Uh, I wonder if the popularity with which the Green New Deal is being received by the press and by the public at large would hold if everybody knew they were going to, you know, their part of paying for it was a quarter of a million dollars. Yeah. Well, the first thing I see when I saw that is that, so if you look at 275,000 over 10 years, that's 27,000 a year. It doesn't sound that bad. <laughs> Because there's a lot of stuff right now that costs over $27,000 a year, like throwing somebody in the prison, <laughs> okay, that you don't get anything out of. At well, least you get, you get jobs as prison guards. Okay, you yes, you do, them. okay. But in other words, they, we are wasting easily the, over $27,000 well, yeah, per the, person the per problem, year. The problem with that is yeah. that that's half of the, you know, or more than half of the average, uh, you know, median income, yeah. which is, you know, forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000 a year. True. Do you want to give up half of your income? to uh, fund this thing? I, don't, I think most people are going to say no. Right. And I think there's a lot of overlap, too. Because if everybody's overlap. guaranteed job, then I don't think we need full security like that. <laughs> <laughs> OK? So, so that, and, and, and when I first heard this, the first thing that came to my mind was that there's so much nothing going on right now in Congress. Zero going on. Uh, we would There's say that, dragging of the feet. We would say that's a good thing. If they're not making, <laughs> if they're not making laws, they're not screwing things and, up. And, 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 yeah, but you're screwing things up. It's just not making laws. Not law. screwing things up. Okay, but I think this is so bold that it sends a shockwave to the system to say, okay, let's do something, whatever that is. That's what FDR said, and he caused probably the worst economic dislocation in history, made the Great Depression last four times longer than any previous depression. Just doing something can uh, backfire big time. That's mm -hmm. true. <laughs> can, can I? So let's just look at the, the switch from, so if this is supposed to be a Green New Deal, um, some, uh, some very smart scientists at uh, a university, I think it was in Northern California, I can't remember which one, did a green footprint analysis of the high speed rail project and uh, in California, which is one, I don't know, thousandth, well it should be, it's probably one one hundredth of the cost of, of this thing. And um, they said that it would take 71 years of uh, operation of the train to um, eliminate the uh, carbon footprint of the construction of the train. So it's a zero sum change. And if we're talking about a 12 year lifespan on this deal, then actually the fact of converting to all of these things and the construction costs associated with them will move that 12 years life cycle that, that uh, for no reason whatsoever except that you grab the number out of the air. I gotta be careful because we're on the air and I can't use the word I wanna use. Um, basically- there's a, wrong, there's a problem with the word ether? Ether, ether will work. Um, will actually shrink that 12 year lifespan if that's her real concern down to about two weeks. So we're all gonna die right in the middle of the massive carbon footprint that this construction project will create in the United States because it will accelerate, not decelerate, this horrible <laughs> carbon dioxide which actually makes plants grow. But anyway, so um, just to point out the fallacy of the argument, not that we need any more reasons to laugh at it, but that, that's kind of one. Well, that's the, the problem point. is people are taking it seriously. Well, you know, well, one of the things, I mean, it occurs to me is that, and I, you know, I personally, I, I think it's a problem. We need to deal with uh, the issues of climate change. But that said, um, it, it's, it's a problem by itself. It's not a problem with all these other things. And much better to have a serious conversation about just that topic than to, and, and what possible solutions there might be than to try and throw a million different other items that muddy the water on the subject. So, I mean, that's, uh, to me, you know, it's funny, um, you know, it's, it's true this may get some conversation started, like you're saying, you know, uh, uh, Edwin, but um, it, it's funny, you know, one of the things that, of all people, I think it was Trump who actually, you know, said and talked about the broken watch being right a few times a day, but he actually talked about having a, a national debate when he started his term in office on this subject. And I think that this is something that we just need to get people talking about because it's, it's one of those things where you're either in one camp or another and 
there's there's not much cross discussion and I think it's one of these things is in society would actually be helpful if we did at least have some national debate on the subject. Well, speaking yeah. of, of starting debates, Trump has started a whole lot of debates by, by canceling treaties. He canceled NAFTA, he canceled uh, the, uh, deal, the nuclear deal with Iran, and he canceled the uh, 1987 Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty with Russia. Russia is not taking kindly to that, or maybe they are. They uh, uh, announced on state television, Russian state television, not a couple of weeks ago, that uh, the uh, Russian government has the power, the Russian military has the, has the uh, capability of using uh, high speed, I forget what they call them. Uh, hypersonic. Hypersonic, yeah, mm -hmm. hypersonic missiles to deliver uh, a nuclear payload uh, to the United States within five minutes. And they mentioned as targets uh, McClellan Air Force, former McClellan Air Force Base, along with the White House and the Pentagon and, and Camp David. David yeah. So, you know, uh, is that the kind of conversation we really want to start? <laughs> well, I, one of the things I couldn't help but notice in that story was the, the fact that they're targeting places like closed down military bases, so they, if, if they're making threats with Cold War information, <laughs> I'm not sure how serious the threats actually are. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, where, uh, where there is Camp David, though? Oh, oh yes. Camp David is right outside. Camp David, of, uh, yeah. right outside yeah. of DC. So, but you know, that's that's Cold War information too. <laughs> yeah. I'm not sure how much new information they have. <laughs> so, but uh, you know, certainly it's uh, it's it's something that you know we have to you know uh, uh, Trump is is pulled out of this situation because. I think he felt like uh, they weren't honoring their side of the agreement. Uh, what was it? Or yeah, that's what, that was the, that yeah. was the, yeah. the excuse. But, but sure. was that but the maybe, maybe they know more than we think they do, right. because sure. McClellan is now the home of the McClellan Nuclear Research Center, uh, a part of a uh, UC Davis uh, research project. So the, I didn't know that. Maybe they mm -hmm. did, and I didn't. Mm -hmm. okay. And also, yeah. too, I think their biggest concern of is not so much Russia not keeping up with the promise, is that they think that the U.S. is using it as an excuse to start to build more stuff, and especially that they want to have stations in Europe. And so by staying under the old contract, they cannot do that. So by pulling away, that allows room for that. So we, I just yeah. start to stay happy. You know? Well, like the Japanese. Like who said it? Uh, the Ch ancient Chinese said, may you live in interesting times, and we, and we are. Mm -hmm. uh, another interesting thing going on in California is the, uh, the great protection for coastal access provided by our beloved California Coastal Commission, Lent versus California Coast. Uh, well, Mr. Lent may think something, the Lent family may ha have a different uh, view on that, right, John? Well, I, I, I think he does. Uh, Mr. Lent um, bought a home years ago. I'm a little fuzzy on dates, um, especially my own birth date. I can't remember that for some reason. Um, bought a home on the coast, uh, and um, the uh, California Coastal Commission uh, pulled out a 25-year-old uh, set of specs on the home, and uh, even though the local authorities... Um, operating under rules that had been approved by the Coastal Commission, because each local coastal community puts together a plan uh, and, and uh, under the auspices of the Coastal Commission about how it's going to manage uh, the coast. Uh, Mr. Lent bought this home, and the, the existing home, um, when he bought it, a, a um, um, I'm, I'm around lawyers all day and I'm forgetting this term, an easement existed allowing people through the property to access the coast. Well, this easement existed based upon the idea that, um, that the, their, their access to the coast through the land would be safe. And it was um, predicated upon the understanding that a, um, um, a stairway from the 20-foot drop on the Lentz property down to the beach would be built, and that was never done. So the previous owner put a gate in to keep people from falling to their deaths 20 feet onto the, uh, the uh, pipe that is right below the easement um, that takes uh, runoff or rainwater um, from the surrounding community and dumps it into the ocean. 
not dirty water, but you know, water that's been cleaned by whatever process they use. So when um, Mr. Lent brought the property, the Coastal Commission said, aha, you're blocking uh, access to our easement and we're going to fine you uh, $4.185 million for blocking this access. And Lent said, wait a second, the access, the, the, the agreement was that you were going to put a stairs down here and it was going to be safe for people. And if I pull that gate away, people are going to fall and, and hold me liable for it. And the Coastal Commission said, yeah, we don't care. You're violating the law, and because they, they have newly uh, gained access to fining, they decided just to go with the maximum allowable fine, figuring that was appropriate for um, the Lents trying to keep people from uh, falling to their deaths. So the uh, another organization, Mountain something, there's so many state agencies I can't keep them straight, has since realized that um, you know this is a safety issue. Uh, and oh, by the way, they 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 made uh, the lents uh, make some changes to their home as well that were part of a so-called 25-year-old agreement that nobody can find. And and another government agency has since uh, decided that uh, since there's no safe access to the ocean there, they need to put a lock gate in. So they put a lock gate in, but the the lents are still being fined. $4.185 million for blocking beach access, even though another government agency put the gate back up for safety purposes. And so uh, the Lentz uh, came to Pacific Legal Foundation and said, gosh, all sorts of our constitutional rights, uh, due process, protection against uh, excessive fines and punishments um, are being violated, will you help us? And we said, sure. And so our attorneys are, are engaged pretty much constantly with the California Coastal Commission. So that's in state court they, at this point? In, in state court at this point. And, and unfortunately, because uh, whatever the California Coastal Commission does will be rubber stamped by, um, they'll, they'll, they lose at the local level. They typically lose at the appeal level. But once it gets to the California Supreme Court, then they win because they rubber stamp it. And then when they're challenged at, um, at the uh, Ninth Circuit of the United States Supreme Court because of its uh, rather interesting interpretation of um, constitutional law, uh, people who bring cases against California Coastal Commission typically lose. So this, this uh, in order to win for Mr. Linton family, um, it's probably going to take a Supreme Court case. And... Uh, Eventually, I mean, who knows? The, the people could come to their senses and realize that you can't have one government agency putting up a, a, a gate to keep people safe and another government agency fining them $4.185 million for having the gate there. I mean, that's just, that's just insane. We uh, worried, or some people worry a lot, that uh, California is becoming a one-party state with top two uh, primary, uh, the Democrats pretty much rule all the uh, constitutional offices, mm -hmm. uh, super majorities in both the uh, state Senate and the uh, state uh, assembly. Uh, but now Democrats are turning into tax cutters. They wanna cut taxes on diapers, cut taxes on tampons or feminine products. Uh, and uh, interestingly, uh, cut taxes on uh, the excise tax for cannabis and uh, getting, getting rid of the cultivation tax uh, for, for cannabis and also uh, in, in, in put in a, a tax credit for, for, for renters. Uh, are, are, are the uh, Democrats suddenly becoming Reaganites or what, Jason? Maybe, uh, maybe they've been using some of that cannabis, I guess. <laughs> well, I, good I, ideas. I'd say this pretty much proves it because two of the taxes they want to cut are on use and oh, cultivation. Oh, use and cultivation. <laughs> and I would say at least they'd be happy. Is that right, Edwin? <laughs> hey, they were. <laughs> and, uh, and I'm sure they just throw in the diaper and the tampon so that they confuse people or something like that. Huh? <laughs> you know, it's, it's good to hear that they're actually thinking about tax cuts. Uh, I, the, the only thing I, I guess, the only thing that gets me is I, I guess I'd like to see, you know, more uniform approach to taxes. And, and you know, if, if it's good to bring them down on some areas, maybe we should try to bring them down uniformly you know, across the board. I mean, this is where so much complexity comes into government when, when you have one item that is good and is not taxed and another item that the government doesn't approve of and is taxed. And 
pretty soon you have this massive complicated tax code that nobody can seem to figure out without a, uh, a couple of attorneys. <laughs> with well, them. yeah, I mean, that's just a byproduct of crony, crony capitalism. He, right. he who has the ability to influence politicians by contributing to their campaigns and so forth uh, gets the, uh, the tax treatment that he uh, is looking for. But what I think is really interesting about this whole thing is, the uh, again, the cannabis uh, tax reductions. Uh, the uh, revenue, the tax revenue that the state of California was expecting to get with recreational marijuana is an order of magnitude less than what's being generated, primarily because black market marijuana is a lot cheaper than uh, official, uh, you know, legally mandated marijuana, uh, and uh, uh, you know people aren't stupid. Sure, and this is one of the the problems that you always get whenever uh, you, there's either a ban or an excessive tariff on something, then you tend to get uh, black market develop on the subject and. And of course, black markets are terrible because then everything's under the table, and you you have a lot of associated crime with it. So, uh, much better to you know have a a, a lower tax on the items so that uh, people can trade this stuff out in the open. Yeah, sort of sort of the uh, the Democrats' revival of the Laffer curve. You, <laughs> if you if you tax 100 percent, you're going to get no revenue. If you tax zero percent, you're going to get no revenue. Somewhere in between. Yeah. On, that, on that curve between zero and 100 percent is the uh, sweet spot where you get the most revenue, and they're trying to you know, raise that revenue by lowering the tax. Sure. An interest, interesting concept. Uh, in Texas, a federal court a district judge has ruled that the mail-only draft registration, selective service, is unconstitutional. I agree with that. Edwin, how about you? Well, I think it's time because change is the only constant. <laughs> and, and maybe back in the days when they put that on the book, there was not sufficient evidence to show that women can do what men can do. But I think over the years, there's more than sufficient evidence. I think it's time to get rid of that. Well, I think it's time to get rid of the draft entirely. Or Absolutely. Draft registration. Yeah, we I, don't I, have a draft. I, I, I go for that. But if you're going to have draft on the book, then it should be fair. It should, you know, women are ready to do much more serious job now, so let, let, let it be fair. Let uh, them have yeah. that opportunity. First of all, uh, getting the draft is my best choice, yeah. but if there's going to be draft, I think it should be fair. I would phrase it a little bit differently. I would say that if you're going to have uh, equality in the services between men and women, make it uh, just as easy for a woman to volunteer for uh, special services or Green Berets or whatever as men, assuming that they can meet the qualifications, and then uh, get rid of the draft all, altogether. Mm. Well, this will right. be the death knell. I'm sorry. Oh, no, that's okay. This will be the death knell of it because um, 51 to 49 percent uh, female population to male. Um, the minute we get close to another shooting war and, and they start talking about 18-year-old uh, girls uh, going to register for the draft, the draft will be eliminated in about a week and a half. So, um, you know, it's, or the it, war if, might not take place. What? Or the war may not. That's or the war may not take <laughs> place, which would be an even better solution. Exactly. Well, yeah, I don't. Know. What's the last time somebody invaded the United States of America? Um, 1812, as I remember, or maybe 1812. Maybe the, yeah. yeah, except so, for the people on the caravan. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> caravan, yeah, right. <laughs> well, I, don't, yeah. I, I, I don't see them as somehow an enormous threat to uh, my safety here in Sacramento, California. Mm. As a matter of fact, I know many people who are farmers who would uh, uh, welcome the labor that they can't find during the growing season. So, uh, not saying that's the only thing that they can do, but you know, many of them are fleeing the the tidal wave of poverty and violence and dislocation of jobs associated with a government which is exactly like the one that, uh, what's her name? Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez wants to create in this country. So I, I, you know, maybe if that kind of world happens here, we'll be fleeing to Venezuela. <laughs> At least they have oil. <laughs> the most, the, the largest oil reserves uh, in the world, actually. Uh, Patriots owner Robert Kraft was busted in a prostitu prostitution sting at a massage parlor in, in Florida. Uh, what are we to make of that, Jason? Well, yeah, it's uh, you know six-time Super Bowl uh, winning owner uh, Bob Kraft uh, 
I guess, you know, he, uh, he was busted. And he wasn't the only one. I, I think there were other billionaires that were busted. But, you know, the, the, the thing that I guess gets me about all this is if, if you can't help but think that this could be a victimless crime, you know, and I, if, if it is a victimless crime, then you think, well, why are they harassing this guy? And well, the so only I'm, way it's not a victimless crime is if the, the, the women working in the massage parlor have no choice, sure. uh, have been, have been uh, basically engaged, captured and are forced to engage in prostitution. That's the only way it's, it's a, that, I mean, th then they would be victims, uh, Kraft wouldn't be a victim, they would be. But all the evidence points to the, the women mostly doing this voluntarily. This is, this is uh, you know, uh, it may not be the best job opportunity for them, but it's the best one that they have in front of them at the time. Well, but is prostitution legal in Florida? No. Oh, okay. The only so, place prostitution is legal <laughs> is in is in Nevada. Okay, so in, in you know regardless in the, whether in the states whether they're doing it voluntarily or not, I think from Mr. Kraft's point of view, if he was caught prostituting, that would be a misdemeanor, right? Uh, maybe a felony yeah. or a misdemeanor. Well, whatever. I don't know, it's, but it's illegal, it's, whatever. It's right. illegal, right? So, yes. so there's two parts to that. Is the women involved? Were they being forced to do it, or they're doing it voluntarily? Well, and, and this is where we get back to black markets. You know, I mean, when these things are under the table, you know, uh, it's it's hard to tell. You know, it's hard to quantify what's what's occurring in these uh, in these scenarios. And so, um, you know, if if these things are above board, like in Nevada, then you can be much more certain whether or not it's voluntary or not. And so, that's uh, yeah. There's nobody working under uh, duress at the Bunny Ranch. In, uh, in in Nevada or, or, mm. or other brothels in Nevada. Uh, maybe you know, he has enough money to the, change the law in Florida. <laughs> maybe so. <laughs> hey, you know, I don't think he's going to jail for it. He has too much money. But you know, one of the things that gets me about this story too is, you know, they, the people who are against uh, prostitution being legalized, a lot of times they talk about harm to the women. You think about the sport of football and how many men are are essentially <laughs> prostituted in that sport, and and they come away with some serious damage, brain damage, and other yeah, things yeah. that we've been seeing lately. And and if that's okay, it's hard to see. And you know, I don't I don't know. Who do we want to protect and why? Uh, do we want to protect Jesse Smollett, who has uh, allegedly no. <laughs> staged a uh, hate crime against himself in uh, in Chicago? Uh, and I got we got a yes or no answer. <laughs> <laughs> Edwin? I think it doesn't change the real conversation, and that conversation is there is this serious racism in the country. Good point. That'll be the last one. We'll see you again next week, same time, same Most place. Same. On the Libertarian Counterpoint, thank you very much for being part of the show. See you later.